first and foremost, I would like to thank the organizers for this great conference in the beautiful city that is Novi Sad. Um, I will be talking about work that I've performed in the past four years, and therefore I will be necessarily not going too much into the details. However, throughout the presentation, I will give references to publications where you can find more details, and of course, you're always welcome to ask questions uh, after the talk. Um, so I would like to start with a great quote from the Russian folklore. If you don't have a dog, your neighbor can't poison it. <laughs> so it may seem funny, but after all, it's a simple and effective way of reducing your attack surface. So what does that have to do with the Linux kernel? Well, the Linux kernel is very much like this Swiss Army knife, this giant Swiss Army knife. It is very futureful. It has everything that you would ever need, but that also means that it has many things that you will never really need. One of such things is the RDS protocol, the reliable datagram sockets. As far as I know, this is used only by an obscure Oracle database. However, it is in the mainline kernel. There are other e examples such as uh, the Perf Events framework. That's a very useful framework for um, performance monitoring of the Linux kernel. Uh, however, you might not need that in your production environment. Similarly, there's an alternative debugging interface, PROTPIDMEM, which you might know of. Um, the same thing goes for that as well. You might not need it in your production environment. And there's also Berkeley packet filters, which allow you to do um, advanced performance packet filtering within the Linux kernel. Uh, similarly, there are cases where you will need that, including in performance uh, and, uh, in production environments. However, it is not necessarily something you always need. So that's something that it would be interesting to remove from the kernel potentially. And the reason I'm mentioning all this uh, is of course, as many of you know, uh, all of the, those features have had CVEs vulnerabilities in the past, which had publicly available exploits for the Linux kernel. So one thing that you might wonder is how popular those features are, and you, you can do actually something very simple, it's just to take your favorite uh, web search engine and to look for the, the, the thing that you're interested in, for instance, Linux RDS protocol. And there you will see that pretty much all of the results, apart from the Wikipedia result there, is not explaining what RDS is doing at all, but rather explains the exploit itself. So that's an interesting thing by itself. You have similar results with other features as well. But all of that is nice, and at the end of the day you want to say that there's a large attack surface for no reason, but we didn't clearly define what it means to have an attack surface or to have a large attack surface. So that's essentially the first question that I uh, address. It is, is it possible to precisely define the kernel attack surface and then measure it? Once we do that, we can in turn develop kernel protection mechanisms whose attack surface reduction will be quantifiable. So we will be able to measure it and say, oh, this has that much reduction. If we tweak it in that way, we will reach this much reduction. And of course, we want this to be practical, not just theoretical stuff. So I apply this to the Linux kernel in practice. So in this talk, there will be three parts. The first part is about the quantification of the kernel um, that was published at NDSS in 2013. The second part is about a method that we've developed um, at compile time to tailor a kernel that uh, corresponds to the features that you exactly need. And the third part is doing essentially the same thing, but without needing to recompile the kernel. All right, so for the first part, um, we'll talk about measuring the kernel attack surface. And first, we need to define what the attack surface is. So quickly, in operating systems research, typically people will talk about TCB, Trusted Computing Base, and measure the TCB size in terms of lines of code. What that will often mean is people will go into the um, source code repository, run a tool such as slop count to measure all the number of lines of code within the repository, and they will say, for instance, that the 
Fiasco microkernel has 15,000 lines of code, that Minix 3 has 4,000 lines of code. And their point is quite clear because when you compare it to Linux 3.0, which has 10 million lines of code, there's really orders of magnitude of difference. But now we are interested in the Linux kernel itself. And in the Linux kernel, we want to be very careful about how we measure the lines of code. For instance, what about source files that are never compiled to start with? There are many of those because there are configuration-dependent code in the Linux kernel. What about loadable kernel modules? Um, code that can be loaded at runtime, potentially automatically, uh, on demand, uh, when an attacker or user requests it. Uh, what about code that is not even reachable from the system call interface? For example, you might have a buffer overflow in the boot code, uh, let's say, when parsing the kernel uh, initialization parameters. Uh, however, that doesn't necessarily matter because if you're there as an attacker and you can control the kernel initialization parameters, you, you already have full control of the system. What about code that is only reachable by privileged processes? For instance, there's, there's a system call for loading and unloading kernel modules, but if you find a vulnerability in the parser there, it's again not something that will be really exploitable in practice because you need to be root to call that system call to start with. So we need to take care about all of these uh, points when we measure the attack surface. And that's what I'm going to be <laughs> presenting in the next few slides. So the general idea of the attack surface is attacker reachable code. And the reason I'm mentioning it is because often it's confused with attack vectors, which is rather basically the API, the entry points that you have um, into the uh, program you're looking at. And the idea for us was to use the reachability over the kernel call graph. We generate a call graph of the kernel and we look at which pieces of code are actually reachable for the attacker based on assumptions that we make on the attacker itself. Then once you've done that, you can measure it with traditional code quality metrics such as um, number of lines of code, CVEs, and so on and so forth. So I'll go through one example. So this is a graph. Uh, each of the nodes here can be functions, uh, for example, functions in the kernel, and each of the edges are calls from one function to the other. So you generate that statically. And then you want to introduce entry points E1 and E2 here. Those can be the system calls, uh, for example, that an attacker can potentially make. Uh, and you also want to take into account um, some important subtleties such as uh, code that will be checking for um, privileges. In the Linux kernel, there are calls to capable function, which will check whether, essentially, whether you're root or not. So this is what we call a barrier function. So once you have that, uh, you can go through and do your reachability analysis. And here you will find out that these three functions are not reachable from uh, these entry points taking into account the barrier functions. And you obtain a subgraph of the kernel call graph, which you can simply call the attack surface. And then, as I previously mentioned, you just have to apply uh, traditional code quality metrics, can be the number of lines of code here. And for example, in this example, we end up with 370 lines of code. All right, so let's summarize this. We start with our program source and configuration. Uh, in this case, the lens kernel for a given configuration of the lens kernel. Uh, from there, we derive entry and barrier functions, and we also derive a call graph, so functions and calls between functions. Uh, with these two, we can create a subgraph, which we call the attack surface. And by picking a nice metric, we can obtain a measurement that we can use later on for um, comparing different approaches and measuring the attack surface. Of course, you might wonder how we come up with those entry and barrier functions, and that's actually very important because it's essentially what the assumptions you are making on the attacker, so the security model that you're taking there. So I'll be presenting two security models that we've used. Um, the first one is the ISOSEC uh, security model. So this is the, um, the running kernel here. 
uh, you have the system call interface, the core kernel code, and also loadable kernel modules that have been already loaded into the running kernel. But there are also loadable kernel modules that can be on-demand loaded, that are simply drivers, and there are also, of course, other si types of loadable kernel modules. So in this security model, we assume that the attacker controls an unprivileged application. That's typically the case if you're thinking of something like a browser escape, uh, uh, somebody that tries to escape a sandbox browser application. Uh, they will try to find a vulnerability within the kernel to escape the kernel itself. So the application itself is unprivileged and has access to the system call interface. So those are the assumptions that we are making. So based on that, you will have a per partial attack surface, so part of the code that constitutes the system call interface, the core kernel, and the LKMs that are already running will be within the attack surface. But you will also have some on-demand loadable kernel modules which will be in the attack surface because code from those kernel modules can be loaded on demand if the attacker requests them. The, the kernel will happily load, for example, um, uh, sockets such as RDS automatically when you start using them. So what that means with the entry functions is that we take the system calls. That's fairly simple. And for the barrier functions, we will take functions that are calling the capable function in the kernel, which checks for privileges. We will also remove all drivers and non-on-demand loadable, loadable kernel modules, uh, because for getting the drivers kernel module to be loaded, you kind of need to put the, drive, uh, the, the corresponding hardware first into, the, uh, into your system, which might not be uh, a reasonable threat model. It might be in some cases. Uh, but in this assumption, we are, we're saying that that's not what we're assum assuming. So that's also what we remove. Uh, we consider them as barrier functions. And there are also some other details that I'm not going into right now. You can look up the publications if you're interested or simply ask me a question after the talk. So the purpose that we have there is to estimate the attack surface from an untrusted, unprivileged process, just like what you would have in a browser sandbox. So that's nice. There's a variant of the security model, which we call static sec, where we do everything the same way, except we assume that there are no on-demand loadable kernel modules. The reason is that in the Linux kernel, uh, there's actually a syscontrol that you can enable in order to prevent uh, kernel modules from being loaded automatically. So that would be uh, something that you can compare against. Finally, we uh, have the generic security model called GenSec, uh, where we essentially assume everything could potentially be in the attack surface, everything that has been compiled uh, when you compile your kernel. So the reason we do that is to, um, first of all, have an upper bound on the attack surface that you can possibly have on that system. And it goes closely to what people have traditionally used uh, in the literature to quantify, essentially, the size of a uh, trusted computing base. All right. So now, I will, now that we can measure the attack surface, I will present uh, one of the two mechanisms we came up with, which is called compile time kernel tailoring, which allows us to reduce the kernel attack surface by making use of uh, the built-in configurability of the Linux kernel. All right, so what we want to do is to go from that huge Swiss Army knife to something more manageable. And what that means in our experiments um, is that you go from the 5,000 feature Ubuntu kernel to about 500 features. So that's for a use case where you will be running a LAMP stack, a Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP stack. And as I said, the idea is that we will use the configurability that is in the kernel. Uh, you might be, most of you are probably familiar with this menu, the menu config menu for the Linux kernel, where you can enable or disable or e enable only as modules um, different features of the Linux kernel. And this is great, you could spend some time on that or maybe a few days or months to get close to a minimal uh, kernel because there are about 5,000 features and that's just for x86. And you would obtain something close to a, a minimal kernel. Uh, and you don't have to take my word for, for it, you, you don't have to trust me that it's fairly difficult to do. That's an email from 
Linus Torvalds to the Linus Kerrigan mailing list where he says that uh, the questions for the configuration are too opaque and he has no idea which of them a particular distribution depends on because he would also like to have something close to a minimal um, kernel configuration. So we solve that problem by automating the task in a way. Uh, we do that by collecting traces at runtime. What that means is that you need to know, and that's very important, you need to know in advance what your workload and use case will be. So what hardware you will be using that kernel for can be also a virtual machine uh, and what you will be running with that kernel. So that's basically the assumption we make there. Once you know that, we want to obtain a tailored kernel for that um, use case. And we do that with those four steps. I don't know if it's easy to see on the back there, but we first start by running the workload that we're interested in and collecting traces from the kernel. We look at which functions are being called uh, inside the kernel itself. Uh, from there, we can use the debug symbols to trace back to the source line locations and basically the if devs that need to be uh, enabled in order that for that code to be compiled into the kernel. Then we use a tool called um, Undertaker that will generate essentially uh, the dependencies that exist in the kernel as a Boolean formula uh, for between the, um, the configuration, uh, the K -config, kernel configuration itself, um, the if devs that are in the code, um, and together with basically the, the values that we've collected from tracing itself, we can put them into the formula, Boolean formula, and we can put all of that within a stat solver and simply solve that and obtain one kernel configuration that satisfies the traces we're interested in. So when we do that, we obtain our tailored kernel by simply recompiling the kernel. Um, and a fun thing to look at is to simply look at which source files are being compiled into the kernel. So in this, gra in this graph you will have on the um, x-axis, that's the number of source files that are getting compiled. Uh, and in orange you have uh, the files that have been removed uh, from your base uh, kernel compared to the tailored kernel, which is in blue. Uh, so you'll see that, for example, in drivers you have 95% reduction in the num number of source files that you end up compiling. And that's very nice, but as I said before, it's not because we remove source files that we are really doing a lot of useful work in terms of security, because it might be that those drivers are simply never loaded at runtime, so you simply don't have the hardware for it. So we really want to look at the attack surface that you, the attack surface reduction that we achieve. So I'm going to show these results, but um, uh, so that's with an evaluation with uh, the lamp use case. We also have another evaluation um, in the paper if you're interested. Um, and but first, I will start with perhaps something that you've been wondering, which is how good is this tracing phase? Because we will be tracing the applications and looking at how many features we need to be enabled over time. But it might be that we are missing some features if we don't trace enough, if, you, if we don't trace for long enough. So that's basically what we call a convergence rate for the tracing. You want it to trace, to, to converge quite fast uh, because you don't want to be tracing the system for months. So this is the experiment we've performed. On the x-axis, we have the time after the system finished booting. On the y-axis, we have the number of kernel configuration features that need to be enabled in order to have a kernel that satisfies all those traces. And over time, we run different workloads. Uh, so after booting, we SSH into the server. You can see that um, this creates a little surge in the number of features that we need in that kernel. Then we simply request one web page from our server. Uh, there's a little search there as well. And next we perform a more intensive um, um, throughput, uh, uh, more, in more intensive requests onto the web server with HTTP perf. And you can see there's a significant increase there. The reason is that this will trigger Apache to create uh, multiple processes and to enable inter-process communication between those processes and that means new kernel features. And finally you will see that it stabilizes. And when it stabilizes we run Skipfish. Skipfish is uh, a web application security scanner uh, from Google. Uh, 
And it will, the nice thing about it is that it will have essentially a high coverage of your web application. It will go and try um, each of the different um, PHP scripts that you have with different requests and therefore it will um, try out almost or close to uh, as many code paths as you have in your web application. So this is nice for us because it allows us to test whether the traces that we have so far are sufficient. And it turns out that there are, they are. So just about five minutes after the boot, booting the system there, we have enough traces even after running Skipfish afterwards. All right, so the attack surface reduction results, we can make nice graphs like this, these ones. Um, your baseline kernel is already interesting by itself because although you would have 10 million lines of code in a normal Linux kernel distribution, uh, if you run slug count on the 3.0 kernel, you have 6 million lines of code here. And the reason is that there are many, um, there's, a, there's a lot of code that is simply not compiled into the kernel because of configuration dependence and also because many of the code is architecture dependent. So that's already one interesting result. And you can see that a, a good deal of the code is in drivers as well, uh, but there's also significant attack surface uh, within other subsystems as well. The file system networking, sound, uh, the core kernel, and also others. So you can compare that to our tailored kernel, which is a little below one million lines of code, uh, which means an 85% attack surface reduction. But that's only in the generic security model where we assume that everything potentially in the kernel is within the attack surface, right? So if we go back to a model where we are, um, we make assumptions based on what an attacker that has access to the system call interface would see, we go down to about 2.6 million lines of code. So that's already interesting by itself. Like if you're an attacker, you can't just find an vulnerability within the whole entire kernel and hope that it will be reachable, there's a good chance uh, that if you do that, you wouldn't find, uh, you wouldn't find a, a vulnerability that you'll be able to trigger. So you can compare that to what we obtain with the tailored kernel and the nice thing is that we obtain a similar result and you can also see that the, re the reduction is not simply in the drivers as we looked at before, but also in all of the subsystems themselves. For example, the sound is completely gone because your web, your web server is simply not um, emitting any sound when you're tracing it, so it has been entirely disabled. All right, so that settles the second part and we will switch to the third part where we want to look at essentially the same idea but doing it at runtime, uh, trying to not recompile the kernel and trying to, be, um, to have some nicer guarantees in, in a way, uh, nicer results. So we want more attack surface reduction also. What that, the reason for that is that we will be tracing and potentially preventing calls at function granularity. We will look at individual kernel functions and at runtime we want to say, oh, that function is not needed by that particular application, for example. So what that means is that we can also be application specific. So different applications will exercise different functionality within the kernel. So if you trace the kernel and look at different functions, you can essentially create views for each of the applications themselves um, and have different views for each application. Of course, the challenge is there. The first one is performance overhead because we will be doing dynamic instrumentation of the kernel at runtime. So you want to come up with a way of not tripping up too many of your probes that you insert into the kernel. And the second is false positives. Because we will be more granular looking at each kernel functions, the tracing that you will do will not converge as quickly as the future granularity tracing that we mentioned previously. All right, so to give an idea of the problem with false positives, we perform this following experiment. Uh, we run on different machines, different applications for a duration of a bit over a year. Uh, so that's about, uh, I think, um, uh, one to three months in here. Uh, so within, within one to three months, you will have everything that converges. So on the x-axis, we have time on a logarithmic scale. And on the y-axis, we have 
um, the number of remaining kernel functions to be traced before we converge, right? So one thing that you see is essentially um, a long tail effect there, um, because this is a logarithmic graph. And what that means is that it's pretty bad in terms of false positives. You will need to wait like one to three months to, to converge to your full set of functions that will be necessary for, for a given kernel function. And the reason for that is there can be all sorts of uh, conditions where different code paths are triggered. For example, um, a memory allocation that fails at some point, uh, things like that. So we need to also think about that problem and uh, find a way of addressing it in some way if we, if we do this at runtime. And we have, um, we've come up with some ways. So here's the four-phase um, architecture that we have. Uh, the first one is a pre-learning phase where we will take all of the kernel functions that are available for tracing and we will look at which functions are triggered above a certain threshold. Uh, and we will call those functions a system set uh, there. Uh, so, for example, that could be functions related to uh, memory allocation. They're used so often that we really don't want to really continue tracing them. Uh, it, there would be no point. Uh, so from there we also obtain the rest of the functions which are called the learning set. And this will go into the learning phase where for each workload that we are interested in, for each application that we are interested in, um, uh, we, will we will use, uh, basically define a given analysis set for each of the applications. What that means is we will see which functions in the kernel are used for a given application under the workload that we are interested in. So this analysis set goes into the third phase, which will uh, try to cluster those functions in a way that reduces the number of false positive or rather increases the convergence rate that we have. So this is the clustered version that you can see there. And then you have the final phase of enforcement uh, where you actually want to prevent those functions from being, those other functions from being called for a given application. All right, so the two steps that are interesting here is the first step which will be there for performance reason. This step will remove many of the kernel functions that are used very often in the kernel and this is great because um, that means that we don't have the performance overhead related to instrumentation of those functions. And the second phase that's interesting is the false po positive um, detection, uh, false positive prevention phase. Um, all right, so for the first phase, uh, the pre-learning phase, as I said previously, we have, we'll be looking at functions that will be hit above a given frequency that is dynamically compu computed, and that we will ignore those functions later on. So to give an example here, we have um, um, the X4 file system, and the X4 file system will, be, will have this code to um, essentially allocate new blocks. Uh, and within this function, it will call another function within a loop. Uh, and this function ends up being called so often when we trace the, the kernel that it, that it trips up that threshold. So that's a nice thing because it means that we can remove that function and consider it in the system set and only trace that main function itself. Um, and in this way, we obtain the attack surface reduction that we might potentially be interested in uh, by removing that particular function, but still not having the performance penalty of uh, tr tracing that function at each uh, execution of that function. So that will, that does help us um, uh, reduce the performance overhead. In the analysis phase, we, we, we do some grouping of the functions. What that means is we, based on some cr criteria, we say that two functions in the kernel are essentially equivalent with respect to tracing. Uh, so one of the things you can do is basically no op, don't do any grouping at all, but you can also group by file, which means that if two functions are declared within the same file in the kernel sources, we group them together. You can do the same thing with the directories where they're um, declared. And finally, we also do the same thing with um, k-means clustering over the kernel call graph. So functions that tend to call each other are clustered together. Um, so with this grouping phase, we reduce essentially the false positive. Finally, uh, another interesting phase is actually the enforcement phase. Um, 
because it's actually quite tricky to do something once you detect that a kernel function that shouldn't be used is actually used by an application. The reason is twofold. First, there are false positives, as I mentioned before, that you might need to deal with. You don't want to really crush the kernel once, uh, when, when you have a false positive because you would be reducing the security of the system. Uh, so that's not really an option. And second is that you will have shared kernel states such as memory that will be allocated within the process of a given uh, fun, uh, of, a of a different process, but that will be used by other processes or other parts of the kernel itself. So if you will, if you would basically kill the process at that point, you might end up with uh, memory leaks. You might end up with deadlocks in the kernel itself. So that's not really a possibility that you have. So we have essentially two choices for the enforcement phase. The first one is simply logging uh, the violation. And that might seem a little bit disappointing, uh, but in my opinion, it's quite useful because you will be ha you will be having audit logs of essentially the suspicious things that have been <coughs> triggered in your kernel. And once you realize, for instance, that something went wrong and that your system was compromised, you can go back into those logs and say, how long has this been happening? What is potentially the uh, kernel exploit that the attacker took advantage of? So that's something um, that's actually uh, quite useful in my opinion. The second choice that you have is to essentially switch once you detect this anomalous behavior into a hardened mode of execution of the kernel. And we have a paper at um, CCS that will be presented in November this year. And I will give a quick overview uh, of what we've d done there. So we, instead of traditionally building the kernel, we build the kernel, each of the objects that are comprising the kernel in two versions. The first version of the kernel is built as it would normally be. be and the second version uh, is built with hardening features enabled into the code itself. So we put these two together with a modified build system that we have. And that enab enables you to choose at runtime whether you want to run in the hardened mode or not. Uh, for, for example, you could do something as simple as uh, to, to prevent stack exhaustion vulnerabilities where um, you will be overwriting the thread infrastructure in the kernel, for example. Well, each time the stack is decremented, you just check whether uh, the stack pointer is below thread info or not. Uh, that would be one thing that you can do in those hardened functions that you compile separately. So the, the nice thing about that is that you can have those potentially very costly hardening features that only get enabled when something anomalous happens. What that means is that during your normal use of the system, there will be no performance overhead that you will observe. So that's one way you can do the enforcement. Okay, now I will talk about the evaluation results we obtained with um, a workload on a Red Hat machine, which is used as a development server uh, for a total observation time of 403 days. We've looked at um, the SSH daemon, we've looked at the network time protocol, which is an interesting use case because it will be uh, exposed on many servers on the internet. We've looked at uh, MySQL server, and we've also looked at uh, the QMU daemon for KVM, uh, which is running in user space. All right, so we, for each of these applications, we've plotted um, a dot on this graph, which on the x-axis has the attack surface reduction that we measured in the static sex security model in terms of lines of code. So that's a percentage. And on the y-axis, we have the convergence time uh, compared to the, as a percentage of the total observation time, so the 403 days. So what that means is that if you're on the lower right-hand side of this graph, your application is, uh, well, your attack surface reduction technique is really good. Um, okay, so for each of the applications, we have a dot, and we have also different colors uh, for the different grouping techniques that we've looked at so we can compare their effectiveness thanks to the way that uh, we've been quantifying attack surface. For instance, we can see that when we don't perform any grouping, well, of course, we obtain the highest attack surface reduction because it's the most grander approach, but we also have a very um, high convergence time. 
you might think of doing file grouping and you do gain um, a little bit in terms of convergence time in some cases, but overall it's not really interesting because it's, it just seems like you're, you're reducing the attack surface reduction without uh, gaining much in convergence time in general. You can make a similar comment uh, with a cluster grouping actually. You can see that if we use k-means clustering over the kernel core graph, uh, we will have a method that will obtain the same attack surface reduction as directory grouping, however, it converges much faster. Uh, it converges almost uh, 2.5 times faster than the file uh, or no grouping case. Right? So that's also something interesting that you can do once you've been quantifying uh, the benefits that you have. All right, so with that, I would like to wrap up. In this talk, we've seen that the kernel attack surface can be quantified. And this is useful because it allows us to evaluate the effectiveness of, given, of a given mechanism that you come, come up with. So you can guide your research and your development in a way that allows you to reason objectively about which mechanisms are superior to others. We've also seen that the kernel attack surface reduction techniques that we looked at are effective in preventing kernel exploits. Uh, so for instance, for compile time tailoring, you would prevent with the attack surface reduction so that we looked at uh, about 285 out of 485 relevant CVEs uh, within uh, the um, um, uh, within the ISOSEC security model, uh, and for well, of course for well-defined use cases. So that's a bit the limitation of that compile time tailoring approach. We need to know in advance what you will be using your system for. However, that is reasonable for things like embedded systems where people will just be putting Linux on and leaving it there and never even updating it, right? If you're not satisfied with that, you can also look at the runtime approach, uh, which does also does very high um, attack surface reduction. We've obtained 184 CVs that would be prevented out of 262 in the static sec security mod. Essentially, it's more flexible because you can decide which applications you're interested in. Uh, it also has higher attack surface reduction, but also slower convergence rate. Remember that the compile time version converges in five minutes. The other takes one month or three months, depending on which grouping you're using. And both mechanisms are practical uh, in the sense that when you run performance measurements, I didn't put them in this presentation, but I also have them if you're interested, I can show. Um, you obtain no overhead or no significant overhead, um, basically less than 1% of, over any workload you would be interested in. Uh, and it's also non-intrusive in the sense that we're not going and saying we're modifying the kernel source code, uh, we're just using the features that the kernel developers have um, developed, such as the built-in configurability of the kernel or uh, instrumentation provided by um, K-probes. All right, so this settles my talk. And these are references where you can um, uh, look at more details on the papers. Any questions? Yeah, go ahead. It's, uh, it's mechanisms like KPAS and KGRAF uh, for uh, run time disable of uh, functionalities of the kernel that are currently running. Disabling functionalities that you don't need. Oh, so, uh, sorry, could you repeat your question? Have you looked at uh, using KPAS or KGRAF? for disabling functionalities that you already have in the kernel yeah. without uh, rebooting the machine? Yeah, uh, no, I haven't. Um, however, so the use case for KPatch and KGraph is different, right? So you, you, have the, you have a modification to a given function of the kernel, and you want to apply that without rebooting the kernel. Uh, essentially, you would be in the same problem as we are, we have uh, at, with the runtime version, uh, because once you're there and you detect that the 
function has been called and it shouldn't be called by that application. The question is, what do you do? Even with um, k, k patch or k graph, uh, basically you would have to write code uh, that will deallocate all the memory that has potentially been allocated along the path uh, or also unlock all of the uh, locks that you've taken so far along the path. Uh, and that's actually, that's the, basically the toughest part. And it, it's not the problem of patching the kernel really, it's rather the problem of what do you do once you detect uh, the thing. So I, I don't think it would help basically, but uh, kpatch and kgrab themselves are useful in their own ways for their, uh, for their, um, for the purposes they've been built for. Yeah. Sure. Um, what is the current plan, if there is a current plan? Uh, is there maybe a timetable for when we will see the compile time? Uh, well, the name of it. Yeah. Uh, logic, when we might see that back in the build system of the current mainline kernel? I, I don't know if it will be in the mainline kernel. However, you can find it uh, online. We've released uh, the code. Um, for the um, for the compile time version, uh, you can download it and try it on your own system and run it. Uh, you just have to Google Undertaker Taylor, uh, and you will find uh, the uh, the software that you can try. So there is currently no communication with the mainline kernel guys to see if this is maybe something that is useful to put it uh, No, we haven't really, uh, but we did. Um, I did present some of this work at uh, the Linux Security Summit earlier, uh, a few weeks ago. And there are some plans for uh, potentially the runtime version. Uh, but the compile time version actually doesn't have to be integrated actually in, into the kernel. You can, you can do it orthogonally pretty much. Yep. First of all, I want to congratulate you on the Thank you. Um, is the runtime version also released as software? Not, not yet. Hopefully, sometime soon. But uh, it, it's not re yet released. Yeah. And I would you, like. To. Uh, can you share if anyone is using uh, both of the techniques, the compile time and the runtime technique, uh, still in production? Um, Well, um, it's not there at the point where you can use it uh, in, a, in a production system, really. But ho hopefully, it will be there um, sometime. Yep. So uh, you said you're tracing the system to see what's actually being executed and uh, yeah. key features are being called. Now, there's a problem, and a case in point is actually IPv6 because uh, there are a lot of uh, applications that check if something is present in the system so they can use it, but they yeah. don't actually need it. Yeah, that's and true. Like, uh, uh, calling this, uh, you actually leave the feature in the system. That's true. Yeah, uh, how, do you, can you, how can you handle this kind of uh, problem? Yeah, th so th that would be an interesting optimization to think of. But actually, uh, as we've seen from the results, uh, even without that optimization, you obtain good attack surface reduction at the end of the day. So it, it's not necessarily a uh, fundamental problem, but I, I agree with you. You know, there will be uh, processes that will just try out something to see if it's available, and maybe they w won't end up being using it uh, because they find that something else is faster or more uh, well suited to their needs. But uh, in the immediate, I don't think it's a huge problem. And also, uh, you said that initialization code is not in the attack surface. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what you call it, initialization code because, for example, device initialization code is in the attack surface, uh, exam, for example, in the USB drivers. Yeah, yeah. Because I use an external part can just plug a USB device which is on them. Yeah, so, so it, you're right. It depends basically on your threat model, right? Uh, so when I was talking about the initialization code, code I was talking about the, you know, the system call bound attacker where that's <laughs> controlling an unpro unprivileged process and there you don't have the threat model where the attacker goes and inserts something into the, uh, into your device. But if you if you take that threat model, which we haven't considered actually, but you could do measurements with that threat model as well by just changing the entry points you're interested in. 
then, as you say, you would also have to consider the initialization code there. Yeah. Just uh, um, go ahead. Have you tested this, uh, or have you tried to tailor a kernel which is uh, running system D? <laughs> uh, actually, no. We haven't. <laughs> we haven't. I, because I, I would have been very interested to see how much more um, circuits is exposed on a system running system D. I, I mean, People can yeah. That this would be a very nice so actually, with system D, maybe the problem is more the attack surface of system D itself yeah. than the attack surface of the kernel. Sure. But so the, it would be interesting to look at the attack surface of system D, for example. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I might try it out on the system D system. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. How do you build the core? Oh yeah. Um, so we use two compilers, um, NCC and Framacy. Uh, NCC builds decent call graphs thanks to um, basically it will. The, the trick with building call graphs is basically always function pointers, right? Um, NCC has good heuristics because basically it's been reasonably designed for that use case where it will create call graphs that take those function pointers into account. Framacy, we haven't been able to really get it to work nicely with the function pointers. However, it's still nice to get uh, um, the call graph in the other cases because there are some things that NCC doesn't handle well. And with both these call graphs, we just merge them and we obtain one bigger call graph. Um, and we've looked at some traces and we know that it's r the call graph that we obtain is basically reasonable. Uh, to, to make measurements on. But that's not necessarily something that I would use, say, for um, control flow integrity or anything like that. But it would be nice to have actually tools that um, get released where we get uh, good call graphs uh, so that it would potentially improve the measurements that we obtain. Yeah. And uh, how do you define the barrier functions? Because uh, the obviously capable is not the only uh, thing that you have to check for. And one other thing is uh, there are places in the kernel where uh, the barrier functions are not uh, obvious. Like uh, if you have, for example, the latest pink exploit, uh, you can uh, create a packet uh, that uh, will exploit the kernel without actually needing to verify uh, that it needs more uh, capabilities. It's just, uh, simply using uh, uh, IOCTL. But then it's good, and then it's in the attack surface, and that's what we're interested in. What, what type of other... Um, I'd, be in, I'd be interested if you have other cases of uh, like barrier functions that you think should be there. But basically when we looked at it, we put capable functions, we put basically we removed the drivers and the non-undemand loadable functions, and we've also removed um, some stuff that we've uh, figured out by looking at basically the, the pseudo file systems where potentially the pseudo file system uh, will have essentially writes um, file permissions that will not allow you to open them uh, although there's no capable check within the kernel itself so that's why we've removed them uh, and also maybe you need to be root to be able to mount a given uh, pseudo file system such as debugfs as well right so that's basically what we've um, found. But if you think there is more, I'd be interested in knowing it. Yeah. No other questions? All right, thank you very much.